Israel has breached the first line of defense in Gaza. Hamas is using drones to drop grenades on Israeli troops. And U.S. commandos are on the ground in Israel. What's going on, everyone? Let's take a look at some updates as it relates to the ongoing war between Israel and Hamas. I'm recording this at 8.30 a.m. Central on Thursday, November 2nd, 2023. Overnight, Israel says that they have now carried out 12,000 strikes since October 7th, which is an increase of 1,000 from yesterday. So a bit of a discrepancy there, and there's going to be a few numbers I call out today that seem a little bit off. This is the first one. 1,000 strikes in the past 24 hours would be the single day high by a lot since this war kicked off. It seems like something's a little bit off with that. Now, as a result of those strikes, Israel says that they're able to eliminate Mohammed Assar, the head of Hamas's anti-tank missile unit in Gaza. Shifting over to the Palestinian casualties, Al Jazeera is reporting via the Gaza Health Ministry that 9,061 Palestinians have so far been killed during the aerial campaign over Gaza, and 32,000 have been wounded. We're talking about discrepancies. That number was 22,000 yesterday. So an increase in 10,000 additional personnel wounded uh, stands out. That that you, you have to uh, call into question the numbers when there are jumps that are that significant. Additionally, Al Jazeera put out that in the West Bank, and more on this later, 132 Palestinians have been killed and 2,000 wounded. Now shifting over to the ground operation, Israel says that they have broken through the first line of Hamas's defense in northern Gaza. Uh, pull up a large-scale map here, again, put together by War Mapper on Twitter. You can see the majority of the focus right now is in northern Gaza and in around Gaza City. However, there have been some incursions by Israeli forces further south. Now, zooming into this portion in the north, you can see just south of Gaza City, the Israeli forces have just about made it all the way through to the Mediterranean, which would completely isolate Gaza City, which that happened pretty quick. Right? The worst is yet to come, actually pushing through the dense urban terrain that is Gaza City. But, but that movement from the east to the west towards the Mediterranean was just a couple days. Israel made, made pretty quick progress there. Now, during these movements, Israel says that they were able to destroy terrorist infrastructure, including munitions warehouses, munitions production sites, and launch sites for anti-tank missiles. Now, we are starting to see an increase in Israeli casualties being reported. You know, really after October 7th, that number continued to rise for a few days as more bodies were identified, and then it really stopped, right? There still were some casualties, especially up north in the ongoing clashes with Hezbollah, but the total number of Israelis killed and wounded was relatively stable for a while there. That's changing as Israeli forces move in on the ground in Gaza. So far, I've seen that 18 Israeli soldiers have been confirmed killed since the ground operation kicked off just a few days ago. Uh, Israel's not put out numbers in terms of total soldiers wounded, but my guess is it's probably in the 40 to 80, maybe even 100 range. There's just been a lot of videos, a lot of pictures put out by Hamas at this point showing very close range engagements, um, you know, RPG strikes, IED detonations uh, against some of these Israeli vehicles that are, are certainly leading to at least a handful of casualties. Now, Hamas put out a video, and we'll walk through here, showing a drone flying over uh, an Israeli position and dropping a grenade, causing at least a few casualties amongst the Israeli troops. I'm going to cut the video before the detonation, just because leaving that in, surefire way to get the video taken down. But it was surprising seeing this. You know, after two years of, of seeing this footage come out of Ukraine every day, with Ukrainians dropping grenades on Russians and Russians dropping grenades on Ukrainians, you just, you know, you'd think that the Israeli military would be attuned to this threat. And militaries around the world would be attuned to this threat. But from what we've seen in this video, it looks like there's there's no jamming going on. This drone has the ability to fly directly over Israeli positions. And then the troops on the ground are just sitting out there in the open. There's no overhead cover. Uh, you can see them from, from miles away, potentially. So, you know, this is a threat. The, it's a very real threat that's going to cause casualties in this war. This is a, you know, it's a single video. It doesn't mean this is happening uh, all across Gaza at this point. But you know, these little quadcopter drones dropping grenades, it's, it's not just in Ukraine. It's going to be forces and non-state actors all around the world incorporating this tactic into warfare. Now, two major concerns when looking at how this war could escalate are Iran and Hezbollah. Now, Iran drew some red lines in the sand pretty early on. If Israel goes into Gaza, we'll have to intervene. Uh, but fortunately, here we are on November 2nd, a couple days into Israel's ground incursion into Gaza. And the most recent thing out of Iran is that they want to put sanctions on Israel. And uh, 
and boycott Israeli goods, which is, you know, not good for Israel, but all things considered, it's quite a bit better than a full-scale war between the two countries. Hezbollah, however, is still kind of a question mark. And it sounds like their leader, Hassan Nasrallah, is going to be giving his first public speech since this war kicked off at 3 p.m. Jerusalem time on Friday. So that's 8 a.m. Central for us here in the United States. I'm not going to try to predict what he's going to say or the direction this thing is going to go. You know, trying to make predictions in a war when there's certain information that's just being withheld from the public, uh, it's a surefire way to get things wrong. So uh, instead, we'll talk about kind of what's been going on on the northern front. Daily engagements for a while now between Hezbollah and Israeli forces. Uh, Hezbollah continues to send some of these anti-tank guided missile teams down close to the border. Uh, as somebody mentioned in a recent video, they are adapting. They're getting smarter every single time they move down, every single time they engage Israeli forces. They're learning and adapting. Uh, Israel has learned and adapted as well and continues to strike and destroy most of those teams as they approach the border. Those kind of low-level skirmishes, which are causing casualties on both sides of the border, has kind of been the status quo for a couple weeks now. But of course, the concern is an all-out war between Hezbollah and Israel. Now, according to a Lebanese official, they said that the red line for Hezbollah to enter the war with Israel would be the destruction of Hamas, as in Hamas is on the verge of not existing, which is Israel's goal in this operation. Now, it doesn't mean that it's it's there, but Israel certainly stated that their goal moving into Gaza is the total elimination of Hamas. So that goal lines up with Hezbollah's potential red line. Now, worth noting, that's through a Lebanese official and not sourced uh, from Hezbollah officially. Now, hopefully a good sign in terms of you know avoiding escalation is that everybody seems to be saying the right thing. It's not too overly aggressive. Uh, Abdul Habib, the Lebanese foreign minister, said, quote, all of Lebanon, including Hezbollah, we don't want a war. There's Western pressure on the Lebanese government to apply pressure on Hezbollah not to go to war. We have dialogued with Hezbollah, and my impression is they won't start a war. But will Israel start a war? We need equal pressure on them too. So good news coming out of Lebanon. They don't want war. They don't think Hezbollah wants a war. They're just concerned that Israel might start one. Then shifting over to the Israeli side, Ron Dermer, their minister of strategic affairs, said, quote, we don't seek an escalation in the north. Hezbollah may decide they're going to escalate, and we're going to have to respond, and we're prepared for that. So good news. Both sides here are saying they don't want a war in the north. Of course, that hasn't ever really stopped a war from happening in the past. Usually two countries say we don't want to go to war, and then it inevitably happens anyways. But if we're trying to look at the bright side here and not say that every little thing is leading us towards a regional or global war, I'd point to that. Both sides right now are saying we don't want war in the North. Now, an area that's not getting as much attention as it probably should right now is the West Bank. As mentioned earlier, since October 7th, 132 Palestinians have been killed and 2,000 wounded in the West Bank since October 7th. It is boiling over there. And it is at risk of opening an additional front, if it's not already, uh, for the Israeli military. Just over the past few days, just to add additional tension to not just the West Bank, uh, but all of Israel, really all of the Middle East, videos and images have been shared by Israeli forces of Palestinians that were blindfolded, handcuffed, and being beaten by Israeli Defense Force soldiers. Now, the IDF came out and said these incidents are under investigation, that the soldiers are not acting in line with the code of conduct, we're not following orders, all the right things, right? But we've seen this before. We've had this challenge in the United States military, where when people wearing our uniform uh, do something they're not supposed to do, it doesn't always matter what the country says about, we're having an investigation, we're going to look into this, we promise. Sometimes just the act itself is enough to throw fuel in the fire and spark further violence. Now, in terms of current or future U.S. involvement in this war, we now have commandos on the ground in Israel, which, look, when I first heard that, I thought it was certainly Hamas or Iranian propaganda, just because we don't use the term commando in the U.S. military. We tend to go with special operations forces. It's nice and broad, covers everything, uh, but I was wrong. Uh, Chris Meyer, the Assic Assistant Secretary of Defense, uh, used the term commando, so that's what we're going with. Uh, he said, quote, we're actively helping the Israelis to do a number of things, identify hostages, including American hostages, end quote, saying that the commandos would join the FBI, State Department, and other U.S. government hostage recovery specialists in their discussions with Israeli counterparts. He added that U.S. Special Operations Forces, so now we're using the term, right, start with commando, move on to Special Operations Forces, are not assigned any combatant roles in Israel, but they are talking through with their Israeli counterparts the Gaza operation. Mr. Meyer also said that U.S. Special Operations Forces in the region are poised to help our own citizens get out of places and to help our embassies be secure. Now, I've seen a lot of like alternative media, fringe media at times, talking about how there's a bunch of American forces on the ground in Israel conducting offensive operations in Gaza. I would be very surprised 
if that was the case. Uh, th this, what they're putting out, Chris Meyer, is much more in line with what you would expect from the U.S. in a situation like this. Israel is an ally. Israel owns that battle space. They're more than capable of conducting these operations and getting those hostages out. Uh, for U.S. forces to be on the ground, in the command centers, helping to facilitate, offering advice, maybe offering intelligence uh, as need be, that is much more likely than actually having American boots on the ground, kicking in doors, moving through Gaza. But that's all I got for now. Of course, if interested in national security subjects, be sure to check out the sit reps I put out on Substack. Link is in the description below. Seven to 10 of the top articles each week, along with a few podcast recommendations. But thanks for watching, and I'll see y'all next time.